welcome to Nothing Ever Happens in Canada, but we know this is simply not true. This is a Canadian podcast looking to explore the myths, legends, and just good old stories Canada has to tell. I'm Canadian Girl, and today is our one year anniversary since we started this show. So I just wanted to throw this bonus episode up as a big huge thank you for joining me this last year as we went on 20 adventures across Canada as well as 4 bonus ones. I certainly could not have done them without you. Chasing ghosts, digging for lost history and gold, swimming in the lakes and the seas, investigating tales of true crime and legends. It takes a team to do what we did and you all have been the raddest teammates around. I'm truly thankful you keep coming back on all these adventures with me. I've learned so much traveling around Canada with you and look forward to our many adventures to come. Here's to another trip around the sun, nothing ever happens in Canada, and another adventurous trip across Canada. Before we head out on this birthday adventure, be warned, like most stories involving lost gold, there is some violence in this tale, just a small scene. Spoiler alert, if this warning does not apply to you, skip ahead about 10 seconds or plug your ears. When the robbery occurs, So do be cautious of that if there is little people around or this is something that you may not want to hear. That being said, you know me. I will never say anything in great detail, just what needs to be said. I thought it seemed fitting to go back to a story like the one that started this all, The Lost Lemon Mine. A tale of murder, cursed land, and a gold mine still not found to this day. Though the adventure we are going on does not have a murder or cursed land, It does have some lost gold, a robbery, and it happens on the Fraser Goldfield back during the famous gold rush that started it all. For this adventure, we're going back in time to the gold rush days to look for a small chunk of fortune that one man may have left behind. Bring those trusty shovels we've used so many times, your metal detectors if you've got them, and your true Canadian crime knowledge as we try to solve the mystery of the lost gold of Scotty's Creek. Our story begins back in 1858 to get the setting just right. We are heading to what was known then as New Caledonia. Today, this is British Columbia. We're just in time for the gold rush to start along the Fraser River. Hordes of people will be arriving from all directions to try and claim a stake in this massive gold rush. With all these people coming to the area, transportation was needed to move everyone about, almost like we have today with public transit. There were many express companies working in the different areas of New Caledonia, trying to accommodate everyone with stagecoaches of all sizes, shapes, and colors. But by the fall of 1861, Bernard Express had purchased up most of the smaller companies one by one, forming the BX Express with its red and yellow stagecoaches were seen everywhere. Traveling from Yale to Barkersville, stopping at mining camps and settlements along the way, this little pioneer transport company would end up serving the Caribou and Fraser Fort George area of BC from 1861 to 1921, that's 60 years of service. They would run a wide variety of coaches over the years. Two horse coaches were called Jerky. This is what the company pretty much started with for the first three years. In 1862, they also began to transport mail on a semi-monthly operation in the summer, and in the winter months, it became a monthly operation. For winter travel, sleighs were used starting in 1863. By 1864, they had 14 passenger stagecoaches that were pulled by four or even six horses. Some were enclosed and some were open. Purchasing a ticket in the summer was $37.50. This would be $590 today. To purchase a winter ticket, it was $42.50. Today, this is $668. If you boarded at 4 a.m. in Ashcroft, B.C., You could expect to arrive in 83 Mile House that evening and then your final destination, Barkersville, two days later. That's a four hour trip today, 413 kilometers, 256 miles. By 1864, the BX Express employed 38 men and had 400 horses. 
more commonly known just as the BX, as the company's popularity grew, it also developed a reputation for being the gold transport company during the gold rush. In 1865 alone, they had moved over $4.5 million safely across the Fraser gold fields. This is over $70 million today, so yes, you could say these guys were known for moving gold. By 1866, they had updated their route from Victoria, BC to Barkersville. By 1867 to 71, the BX was the main mail and express service throughout the mainland. They would lose their contract though in 1871 as they overbid for it because at the time they were attempting to try and run road steamers on their express routes. A road steamer is basically like a very old tractor pulling the stagecoach as opposed to the horses. This proved to be too much money and maintenance and they went back to their horses. They also received their mail contract back after just 10 months. The express company who had outbid them ended up selling it back. At the time, the BX company was said to be the largest stagecoach line in the world, traveling all the way up to Wrangler, Alaska, and having over 2,000 horses. A restored BX stagecoach can be seen today at the O'Keefe Ranch in Vernon, BC. Francis Bernard Jones, the man who had started it all, who had transported so many dreams, mail, and protected all the gold traveling back and forth for so many years with very few robberies, would finally retire in 1879. The company would have new ownership and be named the British Columbia Express Company. The famous horse stage coaches would continue until 1921. <laughs> A BX six-horse stagecoach had just left a farm in 100 Mile House to head south towards Yale, BC. It was July the 14th, midsummer. that's almost 130 years ago to this day, and it was said to be a very hot afternoon. They were in the Bridge Creek area heading up a steep hill. On board, hiding under the driver's seat, one strong box containing $15,000 in gold nuggets and bars. Today, this is worth over $500,000. There is also, of course, the driver, and depending on which version you read, there is sometimes a passenger referred to. But today, for our story, we are just going to leave him out. Some also claim the driver of this coach to be Steve Tingley, that became the owner of the BX Express company after Bernard retired, but I could not find proof of that and there are other claims that it was not him at all. So our driver will remain anonymous for this tale today. Our strong box shipment is heading down to Yale, and from there it would be transferred down the river by boat to New Westminster. As the BX stagecoach reached the top of the hill, the driver pulled the horses over to the right of the path where the road widens, as it is a common area to stop and let one's horses take a breath. As the driver set the handbrake on the stagecoach, he began to relax. He let the reins loose on the horses as they were tied and just started to admire the woods around him and the stars in the clear night summer sky. He suddenly heard a voice, throw your hands in the air if you value your life. The next thing he heard was a rifle being clicked into place so you knew it was ready to fire. A noise no one ever wants to hear when you're alone in the woods with a box of gold. A man would approach from the trees. He was wearing a plaid shirt and one of those standard outdoor hats you see every fisherman and outdoorsman wearing with the big brim all around. His face was covered with a red bandana that had two small eye holes cut into it and he had a Winchester rifle in his hand just as the coach driver had feared he was in trouble. Toss down the box and be quick about it, the bandit demanded. And don't try any funny stuff, or I'll blow your head off. The coach driver immediately threw the strong box over the side. Now move those horses and keep moving, the bandit said. The unharmed coach driver headed south, and he peeked back just for a second to see the bandit struggling to open the box 
before he drug it off the road and into the trees. The strong box was an 18 inch square box all around with no handles at all and it was extremely heavy. It was intended for it not to be easy to steal from. The coach driver looked for it again and continued on to Ashcroft to report the crime. When he arrived in Ashcroft, he could not ID the bandit as his face was covered with the red bandana. He could only say what he was wearing and that he had a Winchester rifle. Constable Joe Burr was in charge of the Provincial Police Department in Ashcroft and he happened to be an old stagecoach driver. He immediately rounded up a group of men to go looking for the bandit. The search party looked all through the rolling hills, wetlands, and everywhere else south of 100 Mile House they could. They could not locate the bandit anywhere, even a trace of him or the strong box. Sadly, coach drivers were not armed and often by themselves in the middle of nowhere, as several robberies were attempted but only few were actually successful. It wasn't until after this incident they began to travel with armed guards when necessary. Unfortunately, since they could not get to the scene of the crime until days later a thunderstorm had rolled through the area and washed away any possible footprints. It is said they found the strong box in the bushes in some stories and in others claim it was found much later. For this story, we're going with it was found much later, as that is what I tend to believe. All known suspects in the area were questioned but turned up nothing. Most people could not believe the bandit had escaped the area with the loot. As the land was so underdeveloped at the time, carrying all that out would have been pretty much impossible by oneself and undetected. But weeks would pass and still no sign of the bandit was found anywhere. People started to believe he had truly escaped. Shortly after the news around the missing bandit and the gold stopped circulating, news about a gold strike on Scotty Creek would spread around the area. A man named Sam Rowland had struck it rich, they said. Sam had been depositing large sums of gold at the bank and the local store in Ashcroft, which he claimed to have found on Scotty Creek. Prospectors began flooding into the creek from all over, trying to get their hands on the latest gold strike. Crowds quickly left, as nothing more than a few small pieces were found in the creek, leading some to become very suspicious of Sam Rowland's claim and newfound wealth. Also, Scotty Creek had been mined before, unsuccessfully, and most people knew that, making Sam's claim very surprising. Sam was mostly described as being a very secretive man. They claimed he was very elusive when asked about the gold he claimed to have found and snapping back quickly at most. He would never let any other prospectors on his land at all. When approached by others, he would be ready to argue at any moment and always had his guard up. He preferred to keep to himself and always had his Winchester rifle by his side. The tale of the suspicious gold in Scotty Creek would find its way to Constable Fred Hussey in Kamloops, BC. He thought it seemed very strange for Scotty Creek to be producing gold. He contacted Constable Joe Burr and told him to keep a close eye on Mr. Rowland until he could get there. Sam continued to deposit his gold into the F.W. Foster's General Store in Ashcroft for safekeeping while no one else turned up with any gold at all from the creek and almost everyone had left to find gold somewhere else. Word would reach Constable Hussey that Sam was in fact planning to leave as his claim had finally paid out. He was quickly arrested by Constable Burr and two other officers before he could go anywhere at Constable Hussey's orders. A warrant had been issued. After writing out his own statement, he threw himself under the bus proving that he had no mining skills at all. Next they headed out to examine the gold at the general store that he had been depositing Gold is like a fingerprint. You can tell which country, region, stream, or river it came from just by its color, texture, and so on. They asked to see the last bag Sam had deposited. 
Constable Hussey and Burr confirmed the gold had not come from Scotty Creek at all, but actually came from several caribou creeks. Constable Hussey would testify this information in court, but assumed it to be generally from the Barkerville region that it was suspected of disappearing from. They knew right away it was the gold from the strong box. The jury would agree with Constable Hussey and Burr that Sam Rowland was in fact the BX stagecoach bandit and faked his gold strike to try and hide it. Here again, reports are confusing. Some say Sam was sentenced to five years in jail, others say 12, at the new Westminster Penitentiary. Fun fact, today this location is a daycare and the Castle Neighborhood Grill, a local pub, located in the northeast end of New Westminster. Sam Rowland would escape after just two years of serving his sentence and never be seen again. So where does the lost gold of Scotty's Creek come in? Many believe most of the bandit stash is still somewhere hiding along the creek near Sam Rowland's claim. A legend says that only $3,000 of the supposed $15,000 that was in the strong box was ever deposited by Sam. So where is the remaining $12,000? That's almost $340,000 worth of gold in today's money. Some believe Sam reclaimed his fortune once he escaped from jail, headed straight for the south and was never seen again. Another interesting claim that supports this theory says a group of railway workers finally found the Pride Open Strong Box many years later just north of Clinton, BC. And it was after Sam Rowland's infamous escape and disappearance. It can be seen today at the Clinton Museum in BC or if you go to my show notes, it will be in the links below. Others believe he buried it knowing full well that people were on to him and the crime that he had committed. For fear of losing it all, he quickly hid his gold somewhere along the creek, knowing he would return someday for it. Also like before, many believe there is no way someone could leave the area with that amount of gold on them undetected. The area is largely remote, known for cougars, wolves, and bears. Most believe he may have not survived, let alone from New Westminster back to his claim just past Clinton, BC along the Scotty Creek. This is why many believe the fortune from the strong box is still hiding at Scotty Creek. Two Chinese miners who had worked for Sam named Wen Li Ong and Yong Lo, they would search for two years hoping to find their old boss's loot, but would find nothing at all along the creek. The BX company would even offer a $1,000 reward for any info on the stolen gold, but it was never claimed. Today, there is a cider named after the famous bandit and his tail, affectionately named The Bandit. The cider is flavored with cherry, and of course there will be a link below if you'd like to try some. Where do you think the gold lies? Still hiding somewhere around Scotty Creek? waiting to be rediscovered by treasure hunters like you and me? Or did Sam actually make it back to his fortune and take off with it, never to be seen again? It's hard to say for sure with this story. The treasure hunter in me wants, of course, for it still to be hiding around Scotty Creek. So you and I have a chance of finding it. I do also agree with most that there is no way he could have made it out of the rugged area alone with all that gold and without being seen. But that being said, if you have all that gold, it's pretty easy to pay people to help you disappear unseen. I'm Canadian Girl. Thank you so much for joining me on this birthday treasure hunt. Until next time, my friends. to support the show you can do that now in three simple ways the first is the absolute easiest way and means the most if you could kindly leave us a shiny five-star review on apple Podcasts, this small gesture helps our show out so much by allowing us to move around on the podcast charts 
so we can meet more awesome listeners just like you. The second thing you can do is stop by our souvenir shop where you can pick up episode themed gear. The shop has everything from t-shirts, sweatshirts, water bottles, cell phone cases, and more. Grab a souvenir today from your favorite adventure to take on your very own. The third and final way to support the show is by donation. We have an amazing PayPal button that you can find right at the top of our webpage allows you to donate as much as you want whenever you want to the show. That way we can buy a new book for research, new equipment, pay for the show's website, You can find all the links to help support the show in the notes below. I thank you so very much for your support. You guys, who always listen to the very end, you're the real party animals at this birthday party and the best gifts ever. I'm Canadian Girl.